All right, welcome back to The Morning Brew here on CNC3. I am Natalie Lagour. It's just about 21 minutes after the hour of 6 o'clock. And our first guest is here via Zoom with us this morning, all the way from Barbados, uh, uh, Barbados Ambassador to CARICOM, David Commission. And this morning, we wanted to look a little bit on how small island states survive in a global economy, how, we, how, how we're perceived where taxes are concerned and compliance is concerned, and we want to look at the European Union and the sanctions it has placed against Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, well, blacklisting them, and how it affects the ease of doing business uh, in these countries. Good morning to you, Mr. Commission. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. How is Barbados doing these days? We are doing okay. We are, you know, we are all in a in a state of crisis, but we're keeping keeping our heads on and we're gonna pull through. Yes, I do believe so. We always do, right? That's the yeah. resilience of the Caribbean, I tell you. We always pull through. But in terms of the pandemic, what, what are things like at this time? Just a little update from you. So Barbados has, from a public health standpoint, Barbados has done very, very well. Um, we, you know, we took the measures right at the beginning. Um, we established a, a totally new hospital to deal with all the COVID-19 cases. We brought in a team of 100 Cuban nurses to help us. So, And the Barbadian people have taken to heart the social distancing, the wearing of masks, all the precautions. So it's very much under control here. Right. Well, I'm definitely happy to hear that because especially in these small uh, states where we rely so much on tourism and we rely so much on on, on people coming into the countries, we need to have a hold on the pandemic. But this morning, you're not here to talk to me about COVID-19. Wanted to look at the sanction, please. I keep calling it a sanction because I don't know what other way to really see it. But Barbados, as well as Trinidad and Tobago, being blacklisted by the European Union and just what this means for the Caribbean. But let's start with, how is it that the European Union gets to determine what happens in the Caribbean and what we should have in place where our banking sectors are concerned, where money laundering is concerned, where tax compliance is concerned. How does the European Union get to determine, sovereign, get to tell sovereign states what to do? Well, first of all, the European Union really has no legal right to do such. Uh, you know, the, the, the European Union, um, and the states of the European Union are equal in sovereignty to the, to the Caribbean nations. So they really have no right, but they're a very powerful grouping. Um, collectively, perhaps the, the most powerful economic grouping on the face of, of the earth. And they simply exercise um, their might. You know, it's a case, uh, I guess it's a case of might makes right. So there are two, there are two areas um, that we, we need to focus on. One is this, this concept of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions. Now, that has to do with countries setting um, their rates of cooperation tax as those rates apply to both domestic com uh, companies and international business companies. Then there's also the issue of money laundering and countering the financing of, of terrorism. Now, the truth is that those matters should really be regulated by genuine multilateral international bodies that the, in, the entire international community um, are, is invested in. Right. Um, but powerful, powerful entities have arrogated to themselves the right to regulate these things. So, for example, the OECD countries, they set up something called the Global Forum to, to regulate issues pertaining to, um, to tax jurisdictions. Now, the OECD countries, which are really the most powerful countries in the world, they really don't have that right either. However, at least they um, as opposed to the European Union, at least they set up a global forum and invited a number of third world countries to be part of that global forum. 
So that global forum sets regulations pertaining to tax jurisdictions. And the Caribbean countries, the CARICOM countries, we basically follow the, the rules and policies of the global forum. And, and we, we, we basically, we don't really have a problem with the global forum. Similarly, the G7 nations, in relation to money laundering and financing of terrorism, they set up the Financial Action Task Force. And, and again, we basically, we, we, we small nations, we have some input into the policies of the um, Financial Action Task Force in relation to money laundering, and we basically work along with them. But then here comes the European Union involving no outside um, nations, making no room for third world countries like those of the Caribbean, and simply coming with their own unilaterally determined rules and regulations, seeking to impose them on us, um, refusing to consult with us, and putting us on these blacklists. And when, when um, our countries are put on these blacklists, what it does is, is that it smears the reputation of the country. It, 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 it drives away um, possible foreign investors in the country. It makes it, it, it makes it more difficult for international banks to be engaged with our countries and to service um, companies registered or doing business in, in our country. So by being placed on these blacklists, the European Union is doing great harm to the countries of the Caribbean. And they seem to have a special liking for Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, because in March of last year, they put 15 um, third world countries on their list of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions blacklist. Um, Barbados was included, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, Dominica. And then again, so that was in 2019, again, in, in uh, May of, of 2020, again, they put Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, the Bahamas, and Jamaica on their, their list of countries with anti-money laundering and countering of financing deficiencies. So and, and yet, David, based on, the, based on the research and based on what we know, even though the European Union has put a lot of these uh, non-European countries on their list, is that the evidence does not suggest that we are a tax haven. The evidence does not suggest that they're losing any taxes as a result of what's happening in our jurisdictions, but more so from countries within the European Union and other big players such as UK and the America and, 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 and Australia, those bigger countries. So why isn't even necessary to punish us for something that isn't really, we're not really causing any harm to them. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the Tax Justice Network, which is a UK-based ad advocacy group in this area, they just issued a report um, in which they say that the countries that the European Union ha have put on their blacklist, they um, constitute 1.7% of tax losses, international tax losses. Whereas the countries of the European Union themselves account for 36% of global tax losses. And of course, um, countries that, that account for tax losses, big, big contributors are the United States, UK, etc. So yes, the countries that the European Union are blacklisting, even if we assume that this business about um, contributing to international tax losses is valid. The countries that they place on the tax, tax on the blacklist contribute a minuscule proportion. Well, when, when you, you compare 1.72% to 37%, obviously the issue is not these small member states. So why do you think the European Union does not include in its list those countries like Netherlands who is leaking money out of the system and countries within the, 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 the uh, European Union that's leaking money out of the system. How comes they are not included on blacklists? Well, the, the only conclusion we can come to is that the European Union has decided 
that these black, non-European, third world countries are not entitled to possess international um, business um, sectors, international financial sectors, that that sophisticated area of, of business economy is to be reserved for European and North American countries. It seems as if they are determined to destroy our international um, business industries. And Barbados is a good example. You know, um, they complained that Barbados had this corporate tax rate where we taxed um, international business companies at a lower tax than we applied to our own domestic companies. So, and they said that this was a harmful ta tax practice. So Barbados said, okay, if, if you are complaining about this, what we will do, we will converge the two tax rates. So we, we brought up the tax rates for international business companies, and we brought down the tax rate for our domestic companies, and we brought them together as one tax rate. And it still they wasn't said, enough. They said, this is not good enough either. Yeah. And, and they put us, and they demanded, that we give a political commitment to reduce our one corporation tax rate. And when our government refused to do so, they put us on, they the, put black us on the black list. Um, they put us on the black list in October of 2020, not for anything that obtains in Barbados now, but they said back in the first half of 2018, the previous government of Barbados um, refused to answer certain requests that they made for some tax information on international business companies. So they said that they're putting us on the blacklist for something that happened two years ago. So, it's, so you believe it's just discrimination? You believe this is just discriminatory on... Yes, on the uh, and I think, I think CARICOM believes that because, you know, CARICOM has been protesting again and again the last heads of government meeting we had, CARICOM heads of government meeting, was on the 29th of October. And our heads of government issued a very strong, scathing statement, um, protesting vehemently against this egregious action on the part of the, the European Union. And so I, I think it has become clear that all these shifting goalposts this refusal to consult with us, this unilateralism, it seems to us that it's all about saying to us, you um, black third world countries are not supposed to have these sophisticated international business and financial industries. That is an economic activity that belongs to us, the developed world, and how dare you um, seek to intrude on what we consider to be our territory. So what we have been saying to the European Union, because all of the countries on their black list are non-European, black or brown countries that were former colonies. Their countries, no European country is placed on the black list. So it, it, a clear intention has emerged. We have been protesting. CARICOM is, is, is taking action. All of the options are on the table. Some CARICOM countries have had a legal opinion on the matter. And, you know, I don't want to say too much, but our, our, our governments are looking at a, a whole slew of possible reactions um, to, this, to this ongoing problem. All right, David, Commissioner, I want to thank you so much for bringing clarity to the issue for us. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Yes. So, David Commission there, uh, Barbados ambassador to CARICOM, and he's saying that EU's decision, unilateral, no consultation, just blacklisting non-European countries, that it's discriminatory. And it seems as if the EU is saying that these black and brown third world countries should not have the sophisticated business and economic activity that the Caribbean, in this particular instance, enjoys. All right, we take a break and we'll be back with you. Thank you.